Born in, in California? Uh, I let, you know, my parents left when I was like two years old. So technically I was born there, but I have no memories of there. And they picked Richmond. They had never been before. They just picked it on the map as someplace inexpensive to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so I grew up in Richmond. Um, and then, you know, again, and then I came back here again because it was an inexpensive an, an place to live um so yeah yeah and it's very um uh, you know like um the civil war is very present in the south in the way that i wasn't ready for coming from colorado like when i moved down here it's just like there's plaques on everything you know it's like there's the capitol building here has a uh, cannonball holes in it and stuff mm -hmm. they're still not over it and uh no no, and you know, like growing up here, I get it really felt like a haunted city. You know, like you, I'd go to the the cemetery with the with all of the um, Confederate graves, and there was like a ghost dog in the cemetery, and and a kind of like, I, lots of people who have been to Richmond have have stories of seeing things and and kind of unexplained tension or. Um, anxiety and it yeah like just as a teenager i felt it i guess that was the first time it was like this town this town has like unaddressed ghosts that are still around and um and you you know i live a couple blocks away from monument avenue so the whole the whole thing was was right here yeah that's i i totally understand that because that, i felt the same way when i moved down here i was like this is there is like a dark psychological thing like a cloud that hangs over like everything and and uh there's like even in my neighborhood here like a couple blocks away there's just like an unmarked um confederate graveyard mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like everything about it like yeah and, and here in columbia this was like one of the towns that was one of the cities that was just completely leveled by sherman when he came down just burned it all you know and uh yeah it's definitely has like a spooky quality to it you know every if i'm driving somewhere it's like uh there's like a signs for like a plantations that you can come visit and stuff like that. Like they're just kind of in the middle of the woods still around. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty spooky. Um, but yeah, what, what were you, by the time you started working on discipline, I was wondering like what you were doing at that time. Like what was your, your uh, output like by the time you came up with the idea of working on that project? Did you just, were you working on Clue at the time? No, no. Di uh, discipline, I started, I guess, right after, right after doctors. Um, so that was in like 2014, that in, in earnest. I, I guess I finished doctors around 2013. Like, so, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I was raised Quaker in Richmond, and I like knew about this moment in history where Quakers were um, pacifists, but they were also anti-slavery. So there was a rift in the Quaker community about whether or not to fight. And I thought it was really, really um, interesting and like, you know, specific to me, or kind of like I thought it, this was something that I knew a lot about just from, from being in Quaker meeting all those years. Um, and, but it felt really, really intimidating. I think I actually talked to you, I can't remember I like at Angoulême or something about it when I was trying to make it feel a little more um, possible, like achievable, you know, it was kind of every the just the fact that you had done some things set in that time kind of made it feel a little less impossible. Like here's someone that <laughs> that I'm talking to who like figured out how to draw all this stuff. Um, because it, de it definitely was feeling out of my out of my wheelhouse, um, but the like 2012 there was a civil war civil war excuse me art show at the at the Met. I don't know if you saw that. I um, 
but uh, that was interesting because you know all of the paintings are pretty small like even like that Winslow Homer stuff of the sniper and and they're, they're, they aren't like giant David paintings they're everything's kind of small scale um, and so just seeing the scale of that weirdly made it feel more kind of approachable um, and then I applied for a fellowship at the New York Public Library um, and they said oh, we have an archive of Quaker letters and diary entries here. Mm -hmm. So that was like, and they, and they gave me an office at the, at the Coleman Center for a year from 2014 to 2015. Um, so that's when I did m like the bulk, I guess, of the, the found, found materials. But I, I knew I couldn't like, uh, I knew I couldn't, spend a year researching it and like making an outline and then trying to execute it. I just knew my personality. I, it would be like giving myself a giant illustration assignment and I just wouldn't finish the book. Um, so I, so I had this idea of just kind of so much of that, um, as, as you know, that kind of civil war era illustration kind of floats in articles, mm -hmm. like, like, a you know, groups of lines depicting yeah. space, but there's missing elements. Um, so when I figured out I could just kind of draw that, that I wouldn't, that I could kind of go get footage like a, like a documentary filmmaker and not know how to, how it fits into the overall story. So like, for example, the library had um, the pontoon, the pontoon bridge construction diagrams there. Mm -hmm. So like I got them and and I like figured out how they made this giant crazy bridge, you know, and I spent like three weeks drawing that. Um, but I didn't know how it fit into my story or anything. It was just like what I was drawing that day. And then meanwhile, I could be reading and kind of getting pieces of things and going down like weird tangents of text. But um, I was still like, like, deluding myself into feeling productive because I had made, like I had done some drawing and also done some reading, you know, on that month or something. So you were um, constructing the story as you were going along, like you were just pulling together elements that you knew that somehow you're gonna figure out a way to structure that into a story? It was all like, honestly, it was all really um, confusing and difficult and like painful and not uh, like, the, because when I, when I um, started going through that material, um, it, I don't know if, you, if you've had this experience, but it, it actually, like the more I read, kind of the more um, unknowable it kind of became and like the more confusing it became. Like rather, because I knew, and like, I, I would know there would be a battle that day, but the, the diary would just be what they ate or the weather, you know? <laughs> right. And, um, you know, someone's diary would just be kind of taught, would, would be, um, we would sort of know all these things going on around them, but their, their text would be about this completely different thing. Hmm. So, um, so then, you know, what I thought might have been a book more like, like Louis Rial or something where it's kind of explaining a moment in time, then because of my personality and the material, it kind of became this thing that was sort of, a, that's sort of about like the dissonance between what people are writing or thinking about versus what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, physically. And then, and so then when that, when I was like, okay, this book is not gonna be about this, it's gonna be kind of, you know, and also cause I'm a big weirdo when there would be text from these, these diaries and, you know, that I didn't understand, understand, I was like more attracted to it, you know, like, like you know, like trying to figure out what the, the person's even talking about. Um, so for, for years, I, it kind of felt like a long collage of text and like scenes, and it didn't feel like I had a, a book. Yeah. Um, and then when I 
when I figured out how to like dramatize some things like like uh, in all of these like friends journals they were having disagreements about um how much whether to pay the taxes that are going to the military and you know to, and um well if we pay them then maybe the government will like excuse these other things we do that don't follow them and just like that whole discussion yeah. um when i figured yeah when i figured out how to like turn that into more of a story that putting that in the book felt more like I had something. And then when there's a, a chapter kind of in the middle of the book, that's um, things going on with the sister that um, is a word, essentially a wordless chapter. Um, because, because also when you read these things, I, I feel like there's has to be so much going on that isn't going in these letters that hasn't like survived the, the the editor of time you yeah. know yeah. um so when i kind of gave my permission gave myself permission on that chapter and kind of imagining things happening outside of the content of the letters then i thought i had had more of a book um yeah but uh but yeah for a long time it was kind of um like pieces for something that i was going you know and like quitting it and restarting it and putting it again and um the whole you know the well, whole you have to get over that right because it's like when you start something like this a historic book one of the hurdles you have to get over is uh if you're a storyteller like you and i is that you're not just because it's historic doesn't mean it has to be a textbook you know you have to kind of get over that and just be like i'm just going to tell a story i'm not going to worry about doing something that the back is going to be have a whole bunch of notes I'm not going to be trying to educate anybody. I'm just going to be telling a story that happens to be set in this time. Because if you start going into that, you go like, well, maybe I should make sure that the gun is absolutely correct. And then, you know, like all these, like you get bogged down in all these details, I think, you know, that like psych yourself. For, you know, for me, it felt like a kind of extra added pressure because there are so few books about Quakers, period. Yeah. And most people are don't know anything about Quakers or or they have you know their 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 ideas aren't accurate so i actually you know getting that hurdle that that you just described that sounded so easy for you actually was like really hard you know yeah. hard for me because i thought like like i'm really going to be kind of disappointing people who just kind of want to find out about this like also it's being near it's being narrated from their perspective so there's kind of key information that that is their lived experience but i'm not you know explaining over the over the text you know like yeah. just the the and now kind of thing like this stuff i i i i mean i tried to um you know i hope it it's it's uh um people can can puzzle it out as it goes on but um you know at the end i did try to point to books that would give people more of a like educational experience than this um but the problem is even you know of course those textbooks are so biased that al almost under under the label of fiction it might arrive at something that is um more truthful um cert you know certainly like you can look at something that you're like okay th you know this was written at this this is an actual like i would hold it in my hand okay this is the actual diary that was written on this day like this is you know quote unquote truth um but it but it would still only only reveal you know a tiny portion of what was going inside of that person's head and the 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 people are not you know modern you know it's before freud and like before like they're not writing down their dreams it's like it's it's their minds i think were were quite you know it, it, it's like i'm just totally rambling here but like yeah. on the on the one hand you could say well their minds are are different than ours but on the other hand you know you can pick it up and read um alice in wonderland at that time and it totally makes sense or you know you can they're they're the great writers that have survived from that time that 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 
Well, they're cataloging right. stuff, right? I mean, those journals, it's just like, yeah, like, uh, here's what happened. And it's basically like a list of things. And it's not really so much about, you know, I, I think about this sometimes because I always try to keep journals for myself. But the only time I really feel like compelled to write in the journal is if I'm depressed or going through something. So I think like in the future, if somebody was going to go through my journal. Just would, like what, once a day? What's a, yeah, <laughs> they would just be like, this guy was so depressed because I'm never writing in it when I'm happy. When I'm happy, I'm out doing stuff, you know, and having a good time. So it's just like this, <laughs> it just becomes like a catalog of the days that I happen to be depressed out of the year. And if there was a, some future biographer or something, they'd be like, this guy was, he has serious mental problems. Look how sad he was, all, you know, and it's just like, it doesn't represent accurately my life. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> But I, I, so when you were being raised Quaker, did you say thee and thou? Did you do that? Or is that just, oh, a, no. that's a sect no. of Quakerism, right? Like a. No, that was just before. Okay. They're, they don't do that. There's nobody. You know, when I, the, all of the things that it come from, you know, that's another thing where it's some kind of thing, like I, the, they were very different than they are today, but they're still like, um, like just if you just uh, if you sit in silence for an hour once a week you know as a four-year-old and a five-year-old and a six-year-old you just kind of have a different um relationship to silence than than other people you know and um so so much of this book is like in meeting houses and that kind of feeling and i think that um even though it's you know, obviously not an autobiography and obviously like a, like so far removed from me that still pro I, I, I could be deluding myself, but I felt like, like I was using like this, the, the cards I had been dealt being like grown up this way. Like mm -hmm. even just the, 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 the negative space in the book and like things kind of coming out of the negative space, I felt like like my, you know, 30 plus years of, of being of like some like muscle of, of quietude had was like strong in me. And like, I got to like, finally use the, use the muscle. Yeah. Um, but, and, and all, you know, like in the, in the eighties and nineties um, in Richmond, it was like, well, it, you know vegan potlucks and like protesting the death penalty in richmond was a, a a huge thing then um and even that like the the um i don't know i don't do i i, I know you're working on a book that is is tapping into your your past in some way yeah, well, I, I relate to everything you're saying because I just I did a whole graphic novel that is just about the history of the Mormon church. And I was I was raised in that church. And that whole point for the whole reason of me diving into a project like that is because I it was about self-discovery in a way. Like I, I wanted to know more about this weird religion that I was brought up in. And I wanted to know the things that the church wouldn't necessarily let me know about, the things that like independent. Uh, research pro pro uh, process, you know, to, to figure it out on my own, because in a way, it gives me a lot of insight about my own life. And, uh, and I also wanted to know if, um, if I researched this faith, if I felt anything in my heart for it, if I still felt like I could, I should belong to that church still, um, because I was pulled out of it by my mother, when I was uh, young enough not to really be able to have a, a say in it. So I wanted to know, like, if I research it, what if I feel some kind of burning in my heart for, for this faith, and it's something that was robbed from me, now maybe I can go back and regain that or something. And so that was what that process was all about. And it's similar. It took a long time for me. It was, I, I, um, it was pretty immersive, like, like the process for this book for you. And um, it's, and it's very, very personal for me, you know, and I, and at the same time, I had to dig through like um, I, I, I know that you did where it's like you're reading all this historic stuff but at the same time you're cherry picking you're extracting the things that you can use you know 
because you have to make a narrative out of history and and people don't understand how difficult that really is because um real life history isn't necessarily straightforward it, it's like it's serpentine it goes all over the place so you have to find a particular thread to follow and the things that you pull out to go on your thread to fit there like have to do with the things that you're interested in so that's how it becomes a personal project because you're like you're choosing what aspects of somebody's life you're going to focus on because those are the aspects that that interest you because you relate to it yourself or there's some kind of feeling in there that has to do with something you felt um it's it's a very totally personal. like all you know even if even if one sentence didn't come from you you're you take responsibility for every you know for everything yeah. and and especially in comics where um you're create you know you're creating the drawing to go alongside it and you're like even just the way you draw something you know like the because yeah i mean you know you know this like like the the like in in this book i knew there would be scenes where like a character like a, a character that our main character isn't interested in or something like a small a side character but i felt like i should draw them you know as a specific person that that was like my contribution to mm -hmm. to or um any uh, yeah like there's a whole other level of of things when when it's drawing and 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 you're not it isn't just appropriating text or just just like like even even if you had something that's like those like classics illustrated things where it's like the sentence from the book and then like a picture to illustrate it like the 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 like inflection in that person's hand and the the like their drawing style or you know how their to you know their composition is like telling the whole story of what they think is interesting about about it was that a reason for it? by the way I, I love this book a lot this book is great Thanks. Thanks. Um, and I was wondering if, because when I was reading it, I was wondering if like that you chose the visual style to um, sort of remind the reader of uh, reading like a diary or like a some kind of like a private sketchbook or something. I think that was it. It was like three things, three things at once. It was like um, the way it was made, being like like I said, like getting getting material and not knowing how it would fit in. So like if I if I had to have it in a grid, then it would be very confusing. I, I basically wanted it to be like edited, mm -hmm. you know, you know, collaged and I could try different pieces of text next to the to a picture at a certain point and see like if it, you know, equaled equaled some other thing. So it was like a practical how do you draw this book kind of decision and then it was that um the feeling of a sketchbook where things float um of course and also the civil war era um the the specials the you know journalistic illustrators their okay. kind of um sketches that uh had like floating text and and um the the same kind of um you know, like um, things come coming out of a blank page. Mm. Um, so it, it felt like it was all um, like one whole one whole idea, you know, the the things coming out of silence, sketchbook, Civil War era illustration. Um, is that the, the paring down of the style compared to your other work, like how, as far as it being black and white and um, being, it's not that your drawings are more spare in it, but the pages seem spare. Is that supposed to equal silence, like a, a Quaker? That's kind of how I thought of it, that, um, that the negative space of the page is like activated. And like you're, as you're going through it, you're kind of picking up information, you know, like at each page, uh, I hope, eventually you're just like find yourself that you're reading it you know and you're and um that it would somehow be more intuitive than if it was in a in inside boxes mm -hmm. um but uh the i had i had done as a mini called new jobs 
from 2013 that used some of that same thing. And I felt like it, it kind of like um, had a, you know, uh, that there was something there. And then, then when it came to this subject matter, it felt pretty, pretty perfect. And you, you did a whole bunch of drawings separately and then laid them out like Chester Brown style? Yeah, like basically, yeah. That's, that that uh, form of like editing, is, is that, I wonder if that was um, sort of influenced by your work in, in film and stuff now where it's like you, you draw the scene separately and then you have the... Totally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I really, that's, you know, there, there's so, the, whenever people talk about the similarity, sorry, my cat is visiting. Okay. <laughs> uh, when, that's kind of the, the main thing that I learned from, from making independent movies is seeing how the editing changes everything mm -hmm. and seeing like different cuts of people's movies and seeing how they, you know, restructured whole scenes. And, um, you know, especially if you're serializing something, you can't do that in comics. I mean, you can to some extent, but the, the like if discipline took six years for at least four of those years, I kind of didn't know what I had, Yeah. you know, and, and it, it came, came together in the, in the editing. Um, totally. And what, when you uh, got the fellowship at the public library, what did that really entail? Was that just, they, they give you an office and they give you access to like a private uh, collection of journals and stuff? Yeah, the manuscripts. I mean, everyone, everyone has access to it there, the manuscripts and archives division, but um, you know, you can get a lot of those books in your actual office there. And you're, you're like there, like a job, mm. you know, every, every day um, to work on your book. And it was, uh, fantastic. Um, and uh, that's when I, I came across the book, The Fighting Quakers from 1867, that is, was like a key, key piece that was two brothers corresponding with their mother. Um, and uh, again, also like, I, I didn't want to like bring a giant drawing table into my office. Like I wanted to, to be able to make things, kind of like you said, Chester Brown style of like just draw something on this sheet of paper. And, and I knew that if, if it was like with a crocodile pen on this paper, like it could potentially fit in with something else, even if I didn't know how it fit in. Um, but there, but that's also why it took so long. Cause you know, I have like bankers boxes full of scraps of drawings of things that I um, didn't, that didn't go into the book. Um, that would just be some idea for a scene and, you know, the, uh, it might, you know, I mean, yeah. Were you drawing on just computer paper, like eight and a half by 11 or something? No, I got this kind of, I, um, it's like B, B E E, uh, paper. Like thicker, um, like a cardstock or something? Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's a little toothy and it's, you know, you get it, it's, it's good, it's good paper. It's, it's like, um, the, I can't, I can't remember. I've only, I only did it for this book because it also like, it was good paper that like fit into my backpack and I could take, you know. Yeah, no, I, I do the same thing. I have like a, you know, I went to, when I was in Angoulême, I got one of those like folders that they, so like every art student carries around. It's like green and black, you know. Uh, one of those like portfolio folders. And then I've just been using that. Like I, you know, I, I cut down my pages so that they could fit in it. And then I just will go to a coffee shop and work on stuff. I can't, I can't just like sit at a desk and draw like on a giant page. I can't do it. I get so like anxious to get up and go do something else or, you know. So if you're like at a coffee shop or at a library or wherever working, it's like you're, you feel like you're kind of there. You're not distracted about, you know, going around stuff, but um. Yeah, so how much in Quakerism, when you're sitting in silence, how much of that is like, you're supposed to be thinking about Christ? Is, is Christ like a big part of that religion? Is it very Christian? 
Um, well, it technically doesn't qualify as a Christian religion because you, it's it doesn't um, ask that Christ is your say that Christ is your personal savior. Oh. Like it, um, it, at least that's where what how it was when I was growing up here in in the eighties. Um, the the you know that's that's a great question. I mean that's that's kind of what I tried to put in this book. Where especially if you're a young boy in the meeting house, you're kind of like or any young person in the meeting house or even maybe old person in the meeting house, but you're sort of like, what am I supposed to be thinking about here? You know, like, why is this a special place? Why are we all together doing it? Why isn't it just sitting in silence and meditation? Um, but the idea, you know, is that it's a community activity and that you're that somehow you're moved to speak and break the silence. And in the book, I tried to get at that, like, um, you know, uh, again, I've been in meeting houses for 30, for over 30 years, but I don't, I think I've maybe sp spoken like twice, like it, it like it, it's kind of, it's like a gutsy thing to like stand up and, and, uh, and feel moved to speak and, and um, because I'm more of an art school student, I think of it as like a, a moment of inspiration that, um, and it, and it's of course it's also su supposedly or theoretically you know egalitarian where there's no like leader of the meeting. Okay. Um, there's no bishop or something. Correct. What yeah. what do you what do you speak about though? Do you like bear your testimony or something? Like, what are you supposed to? Um, well, in the in you know, the truth of the matter is that people speak whatever's on their, on their mind and, and, uh, and it's not edited, but in the, 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 in the book, it's people in discipline, it's people speaking out against, um, the war mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, like a, uh, a woman stands up, um, early on in the book and says something like, um, uh, the only way you can overcome your enemy is to make them your friend, and that doesn't happen when you kill that, yeah. kill that enemy. Um, so uh, the but if, but you know in in me, in 1994 meeting house in Richmond, Virginia, it's someone talking about what they maybe. I mean, I could you know anything what they what what they were thinking about on the way on while they were walking their dog that morning or or what have you um the, is it a conversation uh, can people talk can people no talk? and and the, and it and there has to be a silence after so it's never a conversation um but you know people will there will be definitely like a theme themes will emerge in meeting houses often depending on what's going on in the world Mm -hmm. um, um in the outside world things that are on people's minds would you well, ever uh, do like a explicitly like autobiographical comic have you ever done anything like that before and would you um i'm trying to think i don't uh i guess i haven't done you know in in that in the high school sinking comic and movie there's a character that has my name but it's like obviously a joke about the lead character and these kinds of things um yeah i guess i haven't done something um i guess i haven't i don't um i, I wonder why uh um I, I won't. I I don't feel like I I haven't really thought about it. I feel like I, I you know, I don't know. Yeah. Are you? Um, yeah. Be like. Go ahead. Oh, I just think it'd be interesting if you did do that. But I understand if you, some cartoonists will like talk, will present only things from their life through fiction. You know. Um, so that's another if, way. If I had a good idea, I would do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not opposed to it. Um, the, the, I certainly there, I mean, there's so many great comics that are autobio and there is something about, you know, the, the, 
the already like everything being from like like I would say again we're talking about Chester Brown a lot but like like all of like Chester Brown's comics are like really about what it's like to be Chester Brown and like that's it you know that's like the number one piece of information you're getting than anything else that he's trying to explain um and just even how he renders something is like his his uh view of the world you know um so i think it's there yeah i don't know for some reason for some reason it hasn't um really happened like if i i the yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's all kind of there. Like if 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 someone wanted to puzzle out my life, if I don't know why anyone would want to do that, but if they went through everything, uh, it would be there. So do you, when you're thinking of a story, is it the, the cause every one of your books, I think is in like in a different style. Um, uh, and I wonder if you think of that style before you think of the, the story or if it's like the same, like if you go, I'd like to draw, or you're just doing drawings messing around and then like you are you overlay that over like a painting or something like that. And then do you think like, well, now I, I should figure out like a story that I could use this style in or, or do you, are you always writing? I think it's the opposite of that. Oh. I think it's, it's like, I have a text. It's usually a story idea that I'm then thinking about how to draw. I mean, that's it, been it each time. So, cause you know, people, uh, cartoonists, I think of like some of the cartoonists you've had on your channel, um, you know, it's like the stories kind of emerge out of their drawing and their doodling and their imagination. And um, and I, sen I sense that as part of like the energy of the comic. But um, for me, I don't, I, don't I, I honestly can't tell how it is for you, but the, for me, it's like, Oh, you know, like uh, it'd be interesting to do something about Quakers and like this time, and like maybe it would look like this, or maybe the cover should be like this. Maybe, well, it shouldn't be in color. Like if me, like it's it's all the story is the num the first thing. What you, what are you? Right. Like? Are you writing scripts that you're working from, or are you just go into it with an idea and then see how it goes? Even even if it isn't a full script, it's like. I'm one of those like really boring cartoonists where my sketchbook is a lot of text. Oh, really? You know? Yeah. What are you? I mean, uh, oh, I <laughs> I just go into it like with a, <laughs> with like a general. Sometimes I just go like here's some characters and I have them doing something and then like I, I see what the how the story emerges and I kind of trust myself enough to know that I'm going to get it over the finish line. Like I. Uh, I was just asked to do like a story about um, crime does not pay that comic from the fifties. Mm -hmm. The guy killed, uh, was it now I already forgot his name, even though I just like worked on a fucking 20 page story about it. The guy who murdered his girlfriend, the artist. Um, so I, I just basically made a list of, of everything I could find about that comic and about that, that guy. Um, and then I just dove in and just started just like page one and just started drawing, like inserting the facts that I had learned and trying to mm -hmm. not make it really heavy handed, but just try and make it work as like a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time I was done, I was like, God damn, I'm a champion. I didn't even, <laughs> I was like, I didn't like, have, like super plan this out, but it like worked so well that now I'm like, this is like the best story I ever did. You know, like I, I just felt like, and I, it's not something I could have done any other time, but now in my life, you know, that I could have right. just, you know, yeah, I couldn't have done that in 2009 or something. Uh, it just comes from reading a lot of comics and drawing a lot of comics. And then it just becomes like a second nature or something to, to just tell stories. I think, you know, I, I, I think that the, I, I'm, I've been, I, I've been um, uh, wondering about it myself. Like, I mean, for, for, for me, like I, something I used to think about is that that like, like I did the book New School that was drawn with a thick pen on eight and a half by eleven paper. So like you're drawing, you're drawing with a thick pen on a small sheet of paper. It like just looks different than if you're drawing with, you know, a croquil on a large sheet of paper. And so I used to think that those kind of early um, formal decisions, like dictated how they how it looked 
you know, more. Um, but then I said that to my friend and my friend was like, come on, that's not true. Like this book is like very, very different than this other one. Like, look, there's this different kinds of, you know, or tone or something. Um, so I don't, I don't, it's definitely not uh, on my part. It's not something that it's been, not, I guess it's, it's been natural for me. Um, and I, and I, if I could, um, I don't know if I, if I could choose doing it in a different way, I probably would, but you know how it is. You don't get to choose. You, you grew up reading yeah. comics, right? You were like a little nerd when you were little. Totally. So do yeah. you, you like internalize storytelling? You probably grew up, you probably grew up reading the exact same comics. So in some ways we had the same childhood, Noah. Yeah. But, but you, you have, always were the same person. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you read a lot of manga, which was not, it was not, uh, still not. You didn't read those? No, I didn't read manga. I just read a lot of dumb super, well, like yeah, a lot of superhero stuff. <laughs> it's like, I had so many brothers that were all into comics. So like, it was just basically whatever was in the house. My dad was really, you know, my father was a lifelong comic book reader. So like he would bring us all to the comic book shop and stuff. So it was just like always in our house. But manga was not something that I was ever really exposed to as a kid because I just never saw it. Um, and I'm surprised because I felt I felt like we were right at the the you know invasion of it all, and that it was kind of exciting that that I I would have thought that it would have crossed your radar. Well, the thing was like when I became a teenager, I quit comics. Away. Like I just stopped even paying attention to okay. comics, and I got into like skating and stuff. So I missed that kind of wave but I remember like what they used to call Japan animation like all my <laughs> friends and stuff would be like yeah. we're watching Ghost in the Shell or, you know like all that kind of stuff and so like that was the thing but I didn't I never was exposed to like manga um mm -hmm. until uh, you know as an adult when I got back into comics and you know you'd go check out what was going on in comics and then manga was uh like half the comic book shop or something you know um you know I didn't I didn't have siblings that that read comics, but my dad, you know, my parents were hippies and my dad had like a box of Zap comics and even he, he, you know, Watchmen and Frank Miller and like, he was hip to everything um, growing up. And, and so like the, the, I guess I was all, all in when, when you checked out of, <laughs> of it like I, I I would go to those like anime conventions in the middle of nowhere and and find or you know buy the like the VHS the bootleg VHS copies of of uh, like obscure anime and yeah yeah I remember hearing about I remember when like when Pokemon came to America you know my friends were really into that and then I remember them being like you know in the original versions of this there's nudity and that was like a crazy thing, like really, like a, in a kid's show, like, yeah, yeah, there's like sex scenes in Pokemon and like the original versions and all this stuff, and like yeah. Dragon Ball Z and stuff. <laughs> it is, you know, what's weird is uh, uh, how much that stuff, whatever, it's kind of like when, you, when you're being formed, whatever that was in you right then, just like, unfortunately just stays with you. Mm -hmm. Like the, uh, like those cartoon, you know, I, um, looking at them now, you're like, who is this for? You know, mm -hmm. like these, these, so many of these, like there's a combination of immaturity and maturity or quote unquote maturity in so many of these cartoons. Um, and you're like, what is, you know, who is the audience? Like what? <laughs> um, and you know, the, the movies I've made have had the exact same reaction. Oh, really? Like, who, like, who is this even for you know it's kind of for no one uh <laughs> the uh yeah and even even like yeah i could just ramble about it, but the the um it's I'm, i i wish i could like just get rid of it um the the things that are in my that are stuck in me from that from that time i don't feel like it's well, you don't consider an audience, it sounds like, right? When you're working on stuff, you're not thinking like, this will be good for this kind of person. No, it's usually more like, uh, wouldn't it be, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if this existed? Mm. That's like the main motivation. Like, oh, yeah. if a book looked like this, you know, that that would be cool. Or, so, yeah. you know. 
exact same. I, I never think about like, I got to tap in on the YA market. I should do something like that. I just think like, I want to do this. And wouldn't it be cool if it, if I did this book and it, and we designed it so that it looks like this, you know, like you're thinking the entire, the entire thing all the way to how the book is, is, is going to look. And wouldn't that be so interesting? And you don't, and I've had the same reaction where people have been like, you know, in, in reviews or whatever, like, who's this for? Like what, you know? Uh, and it's just like, well, it's for me and a <laughs> hundred other people that bought it. And, you know, maybe somebody will discover it in the future or something. Like, for people who want to see some rad thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I never think about that. How did you, um, how did you first get published? I never heard you talk about that before. Sure. You know, uh, in the first time I actually did illustrations for the Richmond Times Dispatch as a teenager. So um, that was cool because it was like, I don't know, I was like 15 or something, 16, and it would be assignments. And it was for the, the, the youth section of the Times Dispatch newspaper um, that was called In Sync before, you know, it was before the band In Sync. Yeah. Um, so that, I, I look back on it like totally, uh, amazed you know that that I did it and that they I don't like I but at the time I for some reason I just thought that it was normal to do um but I learned about like I got you know I got paid and like I learned about like scanning and you know seeing your work in print and how it's like darker on newsprint and you know the scale and like I I'd go to the office and like that's when I, I think when I first saw like Photoshop, you know, and um, what was the next thing? Didn't you do like a, a zombie newspaper comic or something like this? Yeah, I did something that was like, I can't even remember the name of the, that. I mean, that was self-published that that was um, like, a, I can't even remember the, the name of the place that printed it, but that was like high school. You know, I think I think because of that Times Dispatch, I printed things before I should have because like because because I had that thing early on I thought like well it's not done unless it's printed mm -hmm. um if I hadn't have gotten that Richmond Times dispatch thing I probably would have waited and and like um because it means I just have like well, I mean, now with the internet, I'm I'm sure everyone has lots of embarrassing things floating around, um, and I'm thankful that my embarrassing things are not on the internet so much. Mm -hmm. But if I could like destroy, you know, my 18 to 24 year olds, you know, attempts at comics, I totally would. Well, who were you ripping off at that time? Like, what did your drawing style look like? Were you like a Rob Liefeld kind of guy? Like all these? No, I you know. <laughs> it was like dip, they were different from each other even then oh. and um they were I don't know you know I don't know it's just like it's all embarrassing like I've just tried to to block it all out the um, what was your, your first book was it like mother's mouth or something like this that was from I I think alternative press put that um and that one was kind of a weird, weird thing with uh, making sections that were unrelated, and I put it together again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't publish. I did. I don't know why I thought it should be printed. It should have just been. It should have just been. It originally existed as mini comics. It should have just stayed as mini comics. Um, but the the uh, that and um, goddess head. Tim Goodyear put out that was other things that were like in anthologies and um the it's all it's all uh you know yeah so so with that stuff though you were just like going to comic shows and doing and selling mini comics and then like Jeff Mason or something would be like hey this is really great kid let me put together a book of this work um Jeff Mason had published a bunch of other th people in the Meat House Collective, and I was doing things in the in um, that anthology. Uh, but you know, I was I was like younger. I was younger than all those guys, and I was like kind of tagging along, and um, you know, 
idolizing them. They were they, they were very successful very early. And and even I'm not that much younger than them, but it still was like a big difference between, you know, 18 and yeah. 23 or whatever they were. And that and was they like were all, very... they were all super young too. I mean, I just was... mean that in my eyes, I was like, yeah, you were the worshipful. Oh. But who was that? The Meat House Collective was like, I know like Farrell Dalrymple was a part of that, right? Was yeah. Brandon Graham a part of that or not? He was there and around and he was very, I met him when I was, I don't know, 17 or something. And he was really, really nice to me. And um, I don't know. I don't know why those guys hung out with me. And, um, you know, I haven't seen any of them for many, many years. And uh, again, I like look back on it very just like grateful that they would that they hung out with me at all. And um, yeah. the, you know, something that I like about your channel too is like I, a lot of these people I like met, you know, a couple times, mm -hmm. you know, at these conventions or something. But I have a fondness for them because they're <laughs> because their lives are are devoted to this medium as well. Mm -hmm. um, so on your channel, that's like the only time I get to see. That's like I get to see what Mark Bell is like right now. You yeah. know, I haven't seen him for many many years. Mm -hmm. So it's just fun to see how um, comics is uh, just destroying everyone's lives as we get <laughs> older and and running us, you know, driving us all crazy. And like, yeah, uh, there's something uh, really beautiful about that. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I, can I ask you a little bit about bottomless belly button? Because I didn't, I never. Sure. How long did that take you to do? I tried to date it at the beginning. It took a. I remember, the, I, I think I put the years at the beginning of the book, but I remember at that time thinking like two years is a good amount for a, a book. Like it's enough to be in that headspace. Um, but I don't know how, I don't know how, again, I look back at it. So like, like looking at a different person and I don't know how they did it. Like I did a, 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 a I think a five page thing for the bottomless 10 year, 10th anniversary for, maybe oh. you were in this same. Oh, uh, the, the fanographics thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah Do you yeah. remember it's like a free comic book day? Yeah, that's right, yeah. From 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they asked, um, Eric was like, could you do like a 10th anniversary, like bottomless belly button story? Um, and I, of course, I thought that would be like the worst thing you could do. Uh, but then I thought, no, like that's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll try to come up with something. And the initial um, impetus for that book was just to have a, di a, a dining room scene that was very decompressed and like a root, like a full, like big mm. scene where there's a bunch of characters in a, di you know, having dinner together. Yeah. So I, I tried to do that again um, and I drew it, you know, with the same pen in the same kind of way on the same paper. And it took me like two and a half or three weeks to draw those five pages. Uh -huh. And when I was doing bottomless, I was drawing like 50 pages a month, something. You know, I just don't, I think, I think it's, I just like got older and I couldn't, I couldn't I'll also, I didn't, I didn't have, I can't, you know, I was basically like drawing on a mattress and I don't know. I don't know where it came. I, yeah, I know what you mean, man. It's like the, the, that kind of energy, but also like, there's like a, an enthusiasm for it all. Like it's very yeah. exciting. And, and you're with that book, especially like you did something that nobody had ever seen before. Uh, it was like a giant brick. I remember being very intimidated by that fucking book when that thing came out, man. It was just like, because I, I was at the same time, I'm the same age as you. And uh, I was still starting out. I was like learning how to do my own comic book and stuff. And then you dropped this book that was like fucking two pounds. <laughs> it was yeah. enormous, you know, it just seemed like such an achievement. And uh, then, you it was know, like, of course, like, again, I look, I look at it and I wonder like what my motivation was, or I, it does seem like a different person. Like what was, you know, what, but I, I, re I remember at the time first, 
I, the, I didn't have a pub, you know, I, I, it was sort of like I had, I was living in Richmond then too, you know, and I don't know, I was trying to make a, I was trying to make decompressed scenes that I hadn't seen before in like an American comic that kind of look this particular way with these characters that I, I think my motivations were good. Like I would like, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not gonna like read that book again cause it would probably be embarrassing, but I, I, um, the, the, it would, as, as you know, you can get in a zone and I was in this zone for body world too. That's like a specific zone where you like, you know, your character mm-hmm. and you're like panel, 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 panel. You know, you, you see it in your comics and Simon Hanselman's comics where it's just like, like just recording the person, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and it, and that might actually be easier over long stretches of time when you're really plugged in to, to, to like with all the daily newspaper cartoonists. Yes, right. So, um, you know, Bottomless was totally done in that mode. And, uh, and I don't, just meaning like, oh, the, you know, Claire, like her at a supermarket. Okay, you know, boom, 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 her at a supermarket. You know, what's she doing, yeah. you know? Take this, t- you know, Polly Panther from from by, like, put him in a convenience store. You know, boom. Like, there's no photo reference. There, you know, and and if any, there's no unusual page layouts or anything. It's just like you know that character and you can follow them. And and um, anyway, well, that's a testament to the strong characters that you created. That you can just put them on the page and you know. Like they write themselves, you know, all the this same thing with like Simon Hanselman's work or whatever. It's like, I'm sure that those characters write themselves at this point. It's like, you, you know, everybody knows who these who these people are, who these animals are and stuff and, and what they would say, how they would react in certain situations and stuff. And that, yeah, that's really yeah, interesting. You know, you know, think about, um, you know, Peanuts and mm-hmm. like, obviously he passed away when the, those characters ended. Like there was something keeping his life going, being plugged into those those the lives of the characters um i did a clue comic that was three months and and you know it was a monthly comic series for three months and um and like i would be walking i did not think about anything other than clue for those three Mm -hmm. months you know like walking to the (laughs) to the grocery store to the gym like just thinking about different gags that you could put into this one page and uh, that like pressure of, uh, of I'm, I remember feeling that way in Body World too. Um, the, the, you know, discipline was very different than that because it was, it was sort of like constructing uh, uh, um, the character. It's almost like the book is the character versus a spe- specific character. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, in discipline, you didn't have any photos of these these people, right? You have no idea. You had to basically invent what they look like. Yeah, and it, and the uh, again, you you know this, um, but like I didn't that that part of that part was hard too. Everything was hard. Like I didn't want it to be so like. So it kind of has to be cartoony so people could follow what's going on. So you need some cartooniness in the character design, um, especially because they're not talking. So it's, it, they have to be legible, but I didn't want to give them like exaggerated features. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I tried to have like these little things um, happen to the person so we could track who was who or give somebody a mole or something that we, so we know who that character is. Um, mm-hmm. but it couldn't, you know, it, it couldn't be so realistic. Not only could I not have like executed it that way, but, um, then it doesn't like read, of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I mean, that's what makes like Roy Crane so amazing is that he's like in that absolute perfect sweet oh, yeah. spot he's of one of the greatest specific and, and, um, legible or, yeah. 
there was this, you know, it reminds me of, um, you know, there was like this New Yorker magazine talk that uh, is with Chris Ware and Charles Burns. And they're just talking. It was like when Chris Ware put out that oversized Acme novelty issue and Charles Burns was talking about uh, Black Hole. And I had downloaded that from iTunes when it first came out and I just had it on my phone. And anytime I had to fly somewhere, I always listened to it because I knew exactly how long it was and I could track how long till I got to wherever my destination was by listening to this, this mm -hmm. talk over and over. And that's one of the things that it, Charles Burns talks about is um, when he was working on Black Hole, he got like an advice, piece of advice from, from Art Spiegelman about the character design where Art Spiegelman says like, put a Band-Aid on that guy so that you know always that that's that that's that one guy it's like just put a band-aid yeah. on him you know <laughs> yeah an eye patch yeah know? an eye patch yeah you gotta do something because it, it's very difficult because like you have a uh, uh, everybody has their own style and and they draw mouths the same way and eyes the same way and stuff and at a certain point you're like i have to figure out some way let me put a mole on his forehead or give him a mustache or something <laughs>